and Michael said he'd be just one minute getting dialed in. And uh, so I'll just share, you know, I was working with someone the other day, and it's a great testimony. I'm going to have to ask him to to uh, write it up or call it in or something, but i um, been doing private sessions with him and going over different things. And, and when we met the other day, he said that it was really wild that, you know, he had moved back closer to home to take care of his parents. And, and while he was away, he didn't see a lot of the family dynamic stuff going on, all the craziness, because he was not personally involved in it. He was further away. And now that he's right there in it, and he said, but you know, he said, it's amazing because since I've been doing this work, he said, I am aware, and I can see it, and I can think, you know, oh, wow, you know, this is their family crazy, but not get involved in it, not get wrapped up in it, and, um, you know, he can stay connected to being and look at it and and attempt to, you know, assist his mom and dad and sister to, you know, engage in the work to do their own healing. and. And so, but he said, you know, it was just awesome to be able, he said, you know, six months ago, he said, if all of this had happened and I'd been right here in the middle of it, he said, I'd have just been bouncing. And he said, but I can just sit back and look at it. And, you know, he was smiling and I said, you know, it's awesome to see you smile as you're talking about it. And so, you know, the work works. Uh, He said that, you know, he was telling his sister, you know, that she really needed some help. She needed therapy or something. And she said, well, you know, I don't trust anybody to talk to him. And he said, well, I can give you a lady's name that you can trust her. And said, she'll help you. So, you know, hopefully we'll see if he can get the rest of his family into doing the work. And and uh, that would be awesome. Um, not really made a whole lot of changes on the website. The next couple months are really busy, crazy. Um, going to keep us on our toes. So I went ahead and created shows uh, out through the end of May, just to try to stay ahead of it. But other than doing that, I don't believe I've made any changes. We do have a couple of questions that came in. So, when Michael, when you're ready, I will read the questions that came in. I think you're with awesome, us. Awesome, dear heart. Let's go for it. Oh, okay. Um, so one says we have we've talked to her before. Her name's Maria, and she says I'm at a loss for words at this moment. A high, a joy. Because my story is long, full of pain, but I received the most beautiful gift for good morning. A mother who loved me unconditionally. This is a gift that I have consciously cultivated within myself for 30 years, and I'm going to be 50 this year. Since adolescence, I was looking for philosophers. I wanted to seek religion, but the Catholic Church shouted that it was my fault. I had to run away from that because the pain in my heart and the dissonance were unbearable. I'm looking for... I am a seeker of the magic of unconditional love in the entire world around me. I never ask why, but rather, why did this happen to me? Today, I know most of the answers, but I admit that I am a seeker. Thank you for reminding me. Thank you for the lesson. But I am going back to the desert to be a diligent diligent student. You more than now, the the Aramaic forgiveness um, says subtly, I will have to be careful and gentle about this. I have to listen to the rustling sounds. So I'm not sure that there's really a question in that, but you might want to address her unconditional love that she's seeking. Yes, for sure. And uh, it sounds like it's uh, um, someone who's really taken a hold of the work and putting it to work in her life, so that's pretty awesome. And as Dini mentions, the idea of unconditional love, and that's carbon-based memories, Uh, game is that love is something I'm going to get from you or I'm going to give to you or I'm going to do to you or you're going to do to me rather than experiencing ourselves as the presence of love. Many times people ask me for a definition of love and I can't, I mean, there aren't enough words in the English language for it, but there is an experiential definition and that is just hold a newborn child. If you go back to the moment where you've held a newborn and you tap into the essence of that newborn, we've asked this question all over the globe between Jean and I of tens of tens of thousands of people, and everybody's answer is always some variation on the theme of love. Why? 
because we all know what human life is. And if you notice when you hold that newborn, that newborn isn't loving you. It's not a verb. It's not something they're doing to you are. It's what you and I are. And our culture being trapped in the Greek orientation and the Greek mindset and the words of the culture, we live in a space where the culture specializes in knocking the experience of love out of us. And then, along about the age of 14, 16, 18 or so, they push us out the door and say, now, go find somebody to love or go find somebody to love you. And my offering is that's a whole false search. It's a whole false language. That language will lead to death. Now, the highest that the not what we'll call the non-being mind or the mind of man has to offer is that idea of, well, I noticed that I was conditional in my love for you, so now I'm going to go to unconditional. But really what most people call love in the culture is just a venial form of approval, i.e., I approve of you as long as you're doing everything that I want you to do. And if you stop doing what I want you to do, then the honeymoon is over and love is gone. Well, love, once experienced, can't go. It can only be what it is. And when we give the mind a false set of goals by falsely defined words, then we're going to be lost in those words. And the goals formed by those words are unachievable. So it tends to lead to an extreme state of frustration for people. And so, and that's why so many people in relationships, they face this deep, deep frustration, like, why am I so frustrated? And of course, they're in denial, it's with my partner. Well, my offering is nobody's ever been frustrated with their partner. But there are lots of people who've had frustration in them that pin their frustration to their brain image of their partner. And so my, my suggestion would be to give up this idea of ever trying to love anyone ever again or of loving yourself into the true definition of the word. And that is experience. Set your mind on track where it supports you experiencing yourself as the presence of love and that you're able to hold that state of extending that love in an all-embracing fashion so that if you were to come face-to-face with Hitler, you could extend love in his direction because there's nothing in you based in pain around the extreme insanity that happened in that time and place. So when I'm in someone's space, If I can't hold to myself as the active presence of love, then I have work to do. There's something in my carbon-based memory system that is resonated in that situation by that person, by those events, that replace my experience of myself as love with some form of hostility or fear. And when I apply forgiveness to that hostility or fear that blocks myself as the awareness of being love, then circumstance in which yesterday I maybe went berserk, I just stand there and go, oh, okay, I see. I am the presence of love. Whatever somebody else does or doesn't do, whatever happens in the world, whatever the travesty or the tragedy, if I can bring the state of being active, present love And and I'm not talking, again, about the venial form of this culture, you know, love is sexual athletics or what have you. I'm talking about bringing the true experience of yourself as the presence of love into your mind, into your body, into every circumstance in your life. That's the assignment. You know, when they tell us that Yeshua, when they asked him what's most important in the law, and the law, by the way, the word means the way it works. It doesn't mean the rule of a spear. What's most important in the way a human life works 
He didn't say love your neighbor. He didn't say love God. He said have rachma for your neighbor. Have rachma for God. And he didn't say love God and neighbor as yourself, like the Greeks tell us. He said have rachma when you think of the creator. Have rachma when you think of neighbor. And by so doing, you maintain your human life, which is love. So the directive was that there's a filter in the frontal lobes of the brain. And there's no such concept as this in the English language or the Greek or the Latin. It just, it just doesn't exist. But what they understood in Aramaic is that there is a filter slash gateway in the frontal lobes of the brain that when active filters out all intentions-based In hostility and fear, everything negative and destructive is filtered out. And only intentions keyed to love are available to the mind to use as raw material for its goals. And, so that's the filter aspect of it, and then Rachma is a gateway. It's literally the doorway into which human life, love, enters a human form. Just because someone has a human form does not mean there is anything that even resembles a human life. You look at people in their rage and their hatred and their vengeance, there's no human life active there. There is a human life behind the behaviors of that particular body-mind unit, but there's no human life active. What Yeshua gave was the key, and, and again, there's nothing in the language. We, we have to build the brain cells for, oh, okay, so there is a filter in the frontal lobes of my brain that if I learn to activate it, if I continuously, when I find myself in any form of hostility or fear, I continuously reset that presence of love, or pardon me, that, that filter, that gateway, then I get to experience the presence of love in me. Now, if someone is just filled with all kinds of rage and hatred and vengeance, that isn't going to last for more than a fraction of a second, and that other energy is going to come in and take over. And so when one enters into the practice of bringing Rachma to activity in the mind, then in physiology, literally, the active presence of love shows up. And if in the condition or the situation where that hostility or fear is active, I then apply forgiveness to remove that which is stored in my carbon-based memory that is based in some form of hostility or fear. And as I remove that, as I forgive that particular energy, then I'm freed of its interference. And more and more, as I move forward, I was talking to someone this morning, and they were talking about how there was a time when they were trapped in alcohol and, you know, crazy, crazy stuff going on, and that they recently had, they've been doing this work for some years, and they recently had an experience that in the past would have sent them back to the bottle and would have had them in crazy time. And instead, they were able to simply stand back and notice that, oh, this is where my mind used to do crazy time. And I've cleaned crazy time out of my mind. So am I perfect at this moment? No, I've got more work to do. But I can recognize myself as love and continue to move forward with the work of being the presence of active love. And then I'm able to extend that love in an all-embracing fashion so that I don't give up my human life for anything or anybody. Whatever somebody does, I maintain my human life. That's what Rachma empowers us to do. So I hope that fits and makes sense and delighted that the tools have impacted you and that things are rocking and moving forward. That's awesome. I actually had gotten, uh, or Jeannie, I think this was actually an email that you forwarded to me. And I just came across it this morning. Just one second here. Let me see if I can locate that.
I'm not. I would have read it so that I made sure to get it correctly. But in any event, the basic uh, message that this gentleman sent, he'd been doing this work for several years and the work of another individual and realized that he had, rather than having to spend a lifetime doing his work through what this other gentleman offered, he was actually suggesting we coordinate and do some work together because our, our work was similar, but as a result of the work he'd done with this other gentleman and what he'd learned with, with these tools, that he felt like he'd literally saved himself a lifetime. So that's pretty cool, pretty nice experience to have or acknowledgement to get that we're having that kind of impact, and I hope we're having that kind of impact for everybody. So, Machini, any other thoughts on that question for you? That um, either I or you could be offering? Um, and you may have mentioned this, and I apologize. I was multitasking here. Um, okay. That saying unconditional, that the focus is still on conditions. Right. Rather than that, all embracing. Right. And, and in most cases, another... that's kind of the highest that the non-being mind has to offer is unconditional. Right. We do have another email. Oh, great. And um, she says, good morning, mind shifters. What is your take on the meaning, if accurately translated, of new heaven and earth? in the scriptures where it says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. Well, I was just talking about that, actually, in a sense, with the experience that I shared from a a woman I was talking to this morning when she spoke of how she used to live in hell, alcohol in hell, and how traumatic it was. And, of course, when one's in that condition, the tendency is to think and to look out there as though the problem's out there. And where today, some of the same things that happened that she would have gone to hell over <laughs> rather than that she stayed connected to active present love. If you look at the kingdom of heaven, that term can properly be translated from the, the Aramaic as the community of love. When I seek first the community of love and I am connected, and not only am I connected, but all of those around me are connected, I realize that each piece of work I do with someone, I get to benefit from what I get to process in me. And so as I move forward in my own work, I am able to extend a hand assist others in moving forward who then in turn oftentimes will turn around and extend a hand to me in my next piece of work that needs to be done. And so my take from the Aramaic on that would be when one speaks of a new heaven, it would be that instead of what one thought, you'll remember Yeshua said, if somebody tells you the kingdom of heaven is over there or over there or over there, believe them not for it is here, it is now, it is within you. So the old heaven was, well, as often this guy somewhere, old guy with a beard and white hair, and we're going to play harps. But when one actually does the work of Yeshua, they are connecting to joining with the community of love, and that arrives in their own mind. Some people might say something like, arrives as a cloud in the mind, and that the clouds are being lifted. So moving into that new space of active present love, and then your physiology, which we would call earth in this circumstance, your carbon-based memory system, you know, we'll, we'll back up a little bit, and if we go to the opening words in the book of John where we're told it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word became flesh, what it actually says is, in the beginning was the mind energy, and the mind energy became flesh. So if we come out of a genetic family cultural system of rage and guilt and grief and fear, self-blame, blame of others, drama and trauma, then that mind energy literally, you know, if you take a look at, go to uh, YouTube and just put Bruce Lipton in as a search term and look through some Bruce Lipton videos, or you can look at, go to our channel, michaelrice.com, or Michael Rice on YouTube, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-R-Y-C-E on YouTube, <coughs> And search for why is this happening to me again. 
and we'll explain exactly how it works. When you think a thought, that thought literally becomes a neuropeptide, a molecule in the body. Cool. Something that was, quote, unquote, not physical previously, now becomes what they call physical. Of course, if you listen to Einstein, he says, on such things as matter, we've been all wrong. What we have heretofore called matter is energy. Energy whose vibrations have been so low as to be perceptible to the senses. There is no matter. There's no such thing as a material world. But when with our faculty of will and imagination, we bring an energy into our field, we introduce an energy that people would call non-physical. We can't sense it with our senses. And then all of a sudden it becomes literally a molecule a neuro, they're called a neuropeptide in the structure. That neuropeptide circulates around in the structure until it finds a cell with a receptor site that matches. That neuropeptide lands on the matching receptor site, and if we were inside the cell watching, what we'd see as that neuropeptide, that molecule landed on the receptor site, we would literally see energy being inserted into the cell. Now, the cell biologists are saying that the cell replicates it. I do not believe it replicates it any more than my TV replicates the signal at the antenna. Well, it is a replica of the signal at the antenna, but the TV isn't replicating the signal that lands on the antenna. The signal that lands on the antenna inserts itself energetically into the wiring of the TV. The TV decodes it, and it becomes the picture that you see or the sound that you hear. In the same way, that neuropeptide lands on the cell and energetically inserts itself in the cell, and what we would call what's coming into the cell when we see that, we would call that chemistry on the level where we believe in chemistry. Mind energy now is now chemistry. Chemistry alters the cell. The earth has been changed. If I come from a system a generational system and a culture of rage and fear and hatred and vengeance and alcohol and drug abuse and illness and abandonment and fight and abuse. There's a whole lot of earth that's in a lot of turmoil. This is the person that's going to be sick from day one. I speak from experience. That's where I started out. The last six days I was in utero. My mother had Toxemia, they gave her Pitocin for six days to try to get me out. And the night I was to be born, they called my father at work and said, if you want to see this kid alive, you better get down here because he's not going to live through the night. I was almost dead four or five times in the first year of my life. The early years in school, I was never in school the first two weeks. I was always in an oxygen tent in the hospital. Drugs, oh, they gave me everything. And then as I matured and I had gotten to a study of physics, something just didn't make sense about taking all these toxic substances and trying to get healthy as a result of them. What I realized was they were killing me, and that's when I began to do this work, and that's when I began to do my work. I was the sick kid all the time in my family system. Unfortunately, each of my siblings, who were never sick, have each experienced cancers and other degenerative disorders. And my physiology is healthier now than it has ever been at any point in my life. And I've been around the sun a few times, a few decades of traveling around the sun. So my take would be that if I look at the Earth suit that I had prior to birth, at birth, the first years of my life, when I lived on an inhalator and pills, drugs, that was, that's how I lived. I had a certain earth, and my earth suit has been totally reformed since then. And I wouldn't trade any year of my life before now for my physiology today. My lungs were always a challenge to me, and up until 
was it about two years ago now, honey, I got COVID. And the number of times I've circled the sun and the history of my lung disorders, I should have been one of the first ones dead. A wheeze that I had in my lungs from day one as a kid, it was always there through adulthood. There was always this wheeze in the background. The last time I experienced it was either the third or the fourth day that I had COVID and my lungs healed as I went through COVID. I got a new earth suit. I got a new set of lungs out of that. I don't believe anybody's ever died of COVID. A virus is nothing but a bit of genetic material. If the genetic material is of a destructive nature and one holds a lot of destructive mind energy with which they are aging and destroying themselves, are dying as a result of it, it might take, you know, if you if you take on an energy system is designed to live for eternity and you kill it within 100 years, that's pretty... That's pretty fast. Our culture says if you get to live 100 years, you're doing well. Well, my offering is we're designed to be eternal. And if I'm willing to face and forgive everything in me, every inclination, every energetic pattern from every generation of my bloodline that's ever died, anyone who's ever died, when I'm willing to face and process those energies, then I get to move those out of my system and each cell that contains some form of disintegrative energy that I forgive, that I process out, that cell is a new piece of earth. So a new heaven and a new earth would be my offering. That's what was being talked about. But because the Greeks didn't have a clue and didn't have the eyes to see or the ears to hear, because this culture is based in that thinking, they think, oh, along came this virus. No, no there's no such thing as killing a virus. There's no such thing as a virus that's alive. Viruses are not life. They're just data. If the data resonates in me what I'm already killing myself with, then I'm likely going to die from that interaction with that virus. But it's not going to be the virus. It's what I'm already killing myself with that's resonated, intensified, that I'm not willing to deal with. I know that over the uh, the couple of years of COVID, there were several people that I processed with, and, and they were in some of the darkest places in their minds and in their lives that they'd ever been. COVID resonated the darkness they were already carrying and destroying themselves with. When one turns that around and chooses to go to work and forgive, remove from the structure that which is creating the destruction of the structure, then each disintegrative energy forgiven, removed, means a new earth suit, a new literal uh, on the level where we believe in chemistry where we with our senses we see chemistry that doesn't make it the end all and the be all but on the level where we see it when we have new chemistry then we have a new cell and when we choose to face and and again go back to those opening words in john what do we have to face what do we need to deal with in the beginning was the mind energy and the mind energy became physiology became flesh Not in the beginning was the word, mind energy. Yes, and mind energy is reflected by words. That's why Yeshua says the power of life and death is in your words. You want to be aware and conscious of the words you use. Because if you use words that represent frequencies that are disintegrative relative to an energy system that's designed to function as and be fully connected to love, then you're in the process of destroying that energy system. If you face everything in the carbon-based memory system of the generations, if you're willing to feel, embrace, hold love present as pain and trauma unresolved from generations, pain and trauma of family losses, of losses of a child or losses of a parent or a war or losses of a property or an accident or, you know, the million things that have gone on. You know, you, you stop and think in the last 75 years, and actually this statistic goes back uh, probably 10 years now, but in the 75 years prior to then, the statistic said at least we had counted that we had killed at least 175 million people on the earth in war. 
What kind of mind energy does that lead to? What what happens to the child being raised up in the midst of a place where a bomb dropped yesterday and a bomb dropped the day before and one's going to drop again tomorrow? What kind of mind energy? Like, what are we doing to ourselves? What is this insanity? And who's willing to literally open up the genes to those energetic patterns that are stored, and they've proven in the lab that those things are stored generation to generation. When I remove those patterned energies that don't belong in my lung, my liver, my heart, or my brain, then my lung, my liver, my heart, or my brain becomes new tissue, a new earth. So that would be my take on that one. I hope that fits for you, makes sense. If you have any thoughts about it, it would be awesome if you pressed 1. And we could have a conversation and see if there's anything else that we need to refine in that regard. So if you're out there in listener land, our call-in number is 563-999-3581. If you call that number, you'll be calling the show directly. And then if you push 1... Through the magic of technology, that's going to raise a hand. Jeannie's going to know you want to talk to us, and she's going to introduce you by your area code. So, Miss Jeannie, do we have anything happening in the chat room, any more emails to look at, or anybody in the phone queue with a hand up? There is a hand up. And I awesome. Let's we'll say hello. Chris, 404, you're on the air. Michael, <coughs> Jeannie, hi. Hey, welcome, young man. <coughs> I uh, don't have much to say other than uh, I find it quite amazing that you two have this show, not a show, but a phone Zoom call or whatever it is, five days a week, religiously on time, and these redundancies are good for me. And you got to hear it a thousand it. times in a thousand ways to fit it all together and make a whole picture that the mind can then support moving beyond the, the past. Well, that's why I try to. That's why I try to get a few listens in a week. Um, but it's just impressive. It's very impressive that for all these years, like five days a week, I guess um, you're dedicated to this uh, one to two p.m telephone call and and I, that me being impressed with that makes me want to listen more even though I don't you know even though I just get little bits and pieces uh, well, you know time. even if I you're guess, not if if you're not available for no. the live show remember we've got over 5,000 hours from the last 14 years of doing this <laughs> so at any time you want it's two o'clock in the morning gee I can't sleep click go look up a topic on the radio show and listen from the, the call from back and you know 2015 or whatever. Right. Well, I've, I've, I find it an accomplishment just that I'm listening to this right now, much less going back in the archives. But are the archives are the archives um, categorized as to subject matter? There is a database you can do a search. Not all of them. Jeannie has kept notes for years on them, but in the early days, we didn't have the facility to make notes. So some of the early shows especially don't have any notes to them. Uh, and they're actually some of the most powerful shows. If you do go back to listen, you know, the, the way to get to them, if you go to our website, yagain.org, and there's a picture of a microphone on the page, if you click that picture, you can drill down. And in particular, there's, and I'm not sure exactly how they're titled, Jeannie can tell us, there's a, a section of what we consider to be our most important shows, the ones that were, you know, like, seeing this one's like, this is really on track. So, there are a number of those, and also in that grouping, there are a number of shows where we've done worksheets with people so that you can listen in on a live worksheet that, you know, I, I think there right now there's something like 22 or 23 hours of shows where we've been doing worksheets with people. And, you know, when I do a worksheet with someone, this person has this refinement and this question, and that person has a different refinement, a different question, and the next person brings up a different idea. So if you listen to all of those, you'll get a much bigger picture of how the forgiveness process works and how the worksheet is done. Um, okay. I do have a – now I do have a, a 
Bible question. I thought it up. Great. Um, is there a readily available Bible, um, I'm going to say, that you would approve of uh, for reading, I mean, like be it the Aramaic, uh, if there's reprints of that manuscript? I mean, like, I, I can't pick up King James and start reading that. I mean, I'm confident in the English language, but I'm, I feel like I'm. Right. it's all group. Greek to me. It's all Greek. What? That's exactly what Yeshua would say. If he sat in most of the church, indeed, he'd say, say, that's all Greek to me. Because it is. So what readily available Bible is there that you would recommend, if there is one? Well, there is a, a text that was done by a man named George Lamsa. And Lamsa's Bible, it's is what it's called, has, unfortunately, very few changes compared to what should have been. Lamps was doing this back in the 50s. The good uh, fundamental folks of the, of the country literally were threatening to murder him because he wasn't following the King James Version of the Bible. I mean, literally, he feared wow. for his life and had death threats. So wow. George Lamps was a native Aramaic spe- speaker, and he made approximately... 1,600 changes out of what he should, said should have been at least 10,000. So the work that's available in that text is sparse, and you've got to do a lot of reading to get to it. So, I mean, that's a, a great text. The introduction is good, but, you know, with 1,600 changes through that whole book, it's hard to really make sense of it or make it usable. However, George Lamsa does have several books and his protege, Rocco Errico, who, by the way, is in Atlanta, and I think is speaking at the, uh, let's see, what's the name of the center? Um, well, I'm in Barbara Atlanta. King's. Yes, that's why I'm saying George, or uh, Rocco Errico. And Barbara George, King's yes. Hillside Chapel. If you check them out, you can go hang out with Rocco. He was my first teacher in the Aramaic. He introduced me to the Aramaic language. And he and I used to work together. I used to Barbara King's Church, which is called Hillside Chapel down on the south side of Atlanta. Okay. And Rocco is the um, Aramaic professor there. And he has a website. He has a website, Nura. And o o h r a dot com. He's got a lot of uh, Aramaic stuff on there, but he has rewritten some of Lamps's commentaries. So there, it would be more useful to you to read their, the commentaries than it would be to get the Lamps of Bible. Would be my offering. Because but I could also again, go to, it's I could also find out about their church service as well. Yes, yes. And Lamps has got a, a text called. Uh, Gospel light, more light on the gospel, Old Testament light, idioms of the Bibles explained, um, the Lord's Prayer. I mean, he's got a whole raft of things, and Rocco has rewritten some of those, so that's all available. And if you check with Nora, N O O H R A dot com, you'll see, he, you know, Rocco has all that stuff listed. We also, the text that we're working with from the Aramaic, the, um, and it's the only place I know this particular work with the Kabor manuscript where you'll find the deep psychological insight into the teachings of Yeshua. Um, many, in many cases where someone has translated from the Aramaic, they actually took a Greek text and then translated it from the Aramaic, or pardon me, translated it back into Aramaic, but they still had that Greek influence. And so what we're working with, and basically the, the text we're working with is called Enlightenment, and it's uh, what we published so far from the Kabor's manuscript, and it's a, a text that if you go to our, our website on our catalog, it sells for $25 plus shipping. If you want to get a copy and you just go to the website rather than paying shipping and all that, and it adds it automatically, we can't change that. But if you want to get a copy of it, if you go to uh, whyagain.org, down at the bottom there's a donate button. And if you just donate $26, 
it goes through PayPal, they get something like a buck and a half, so it takes care of them. We'll pay the shipping. So if you want a copy of no, this text. What's the name of it? What's the name of it? It's, it's Enlightenment. Enlightenment. Okay. So if you just put, give us your, your address and Enlightenment, uh, then we'll know that $26 is for Enlightenment, and we'll get one out right, right away to you. Yes, okay. Gosh, were the, uh, were the Greeks good for anything? Oh, well, you know, I think they gave us a lot of good stuff. And, you know, there's, a, there's an interesting passage in the scriptures where Yeshua talks about those who are the highest in a certain realm are the lowest in what, again, was translated as the kingdom of heaven. And what they were saying is, you know, carbon-based memory, the body's mind can only go so far because it's an inferior device. It can't, it can't reflect the actuality of life. So when Yeshua talked about that, he said, so, so you've got these people that are brilliant, they're geniuses, they have wonderful minds, and the very highest of those, like in, in the realm of man, they're at level 100 on the 100-step you know, ladder. But the minute they step over that, they're on step one in the community of love. Because are you, ta- are you, are you talking about... Are you talking about Greek culture? I mean, I don't know that much about it. I remember in, you know, grade school, you know, learning a little bit about Greek mythology, but, I mean, um, does the Greek culture and have anything positive to contribute? It sounds almost like not. <laughs> well, it's, it's relative, you know. I, there, in terms of the way human minds think, that is some pretty incredible stuff some pretty amazing stuff. But when you go to the way the human being functions, all of that is inferior. So again, they're the, they're the pinnacle of human culture, at least one of, the Chinese as well. They did just some amazing stuff. But the pinnacle of human culture, when you think of human being this body-mind unit and the, the ability of the mind to perceive, to create constructs called perception, which is what you want to be collapsing with forgiveness, they're the pinnacle. But then when you go to living in the actuality, you know, there's, there's um, some Harvard research that we've talked about that says that in a time frame, where 10,000 brain cells are firing. You know, they've got somebody hooked up to electrodes, and they measure that there are 10,000 brain cells firing off. What they tell us is, and this is some of the most um, quoted research in all of history, of, of psychological history, it goes back, and uh, that in that time frame where 10,000 brain cells are firing, the max amount of data that goes into building perception is nine bits. So we've got this... 10,000 brain cells firing, and the mind filters it down to nine pieces of data. It's been estimated in the same time frame that the actuality of the world is perhaps 20 trillion bits of data. So if that's accurate and we're, actually, we're living in an actual 20 trillion bit world with a nine bit mind that's only able to comprehend from 10,000 bits of information, it's a pretty inferior device. My take is that in our being, in the truth of who we are, that newborn, when you hold them, that newborn is designed to be capable of functioning within the 20 trillion bit world. And we've been shut down to a nine bit mind that is the inheritor of the hostilities, the fears, the rages, the guilt, the grief, the pain, the drama and trauma of the world. But what is that 20,000, 20 trillion bit baby what if that baby has the best of parents and on the planet and there's just, there's no abuse, no any, you know, that baby's the way. Then we're going to say what we've got is we've got a true human being happening here. They're few and far between. It does happen. You mean there are parents like that on this earth that can keep the baby's 20 trillion bits cognizant? Well, I, I haven't met anybody that's fully arrived, but I know a lot of people who are progressing in that direction. I look at, you know, I was doing this work back when I had my children, and they're now in their 40s, and with what I know now, there are so many things I lament having done 
that I what? sure as heck would have done very, very differently than today. And today I have what about, this awesome what a, little teacher. What about stuff like... I, oh, 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 just, let, me, let me just finish the thought off here so I can complete that thought. So I, I now have this teacher that's five who's came into the earth, into the world, very clearly to me as the active presence of love, as did my daughter. When my daughter was born, I caught her in my hands, and she opened her eyes and looked at me and literally sent me into that 20 trillion bit world. I now realize that's what happened. It was just monumental. But I still hadn't done enough work to be as clean and clear with her as I'm able to be now with our granddaughter, who's five, who's teaching me how to function as love and how to see her only as love and to assist her in building her energy field, her body mind unit, to be a fit vehicle to express who her created essence is. To me, that's what parenthood is about, that each of us were designed to give to our children. But the world hasn't done a very good job of teaching us that. That's amazing. I imagine, um, I'm I'm gonna guess that corporal punishment of children, you know, spare the rod, spoil the child, doesn't figure into the scenario of proper child Not in a million really. years. Well, the, I mean, the, the child. Done it. What? Yeah, unfortunately. We, My offering we've all, is. I mean, we've all done it. You know, there's, she's four years old, and you, you, slap, you slap her or him. Um, unfortunately, I haven't done the, that, but. Well, I mean. The voice, the look. You know, I mean, I have. I mean, it was like twice yep. in my two daughters' lives, you know. I mean, nothing, you know, nothing that would be considered abnormal parenting. They may have been yep. six or seven or whatever. Yeah. But that's not good. It's not good, you're saying. No. No, what I'm, what I'm offering, you know, if you think about how tender one of the things i'll often hear from people when i talk you know when i have a conversation like this and somebody will say well you know my parents slapped me around a good bout but but it never hurt me it's like excuse me friend if i were able to take you back to the moment where that parent not even slapped you not even said something but when that parent turned to you with hostility in their eyes, if I could take you back to that moment, into that tender space, you would experience some of the most extreme pain that any human being has ever experienced. Oh, because, well, I remember, and, and it, it I, remember it. I remember every time I got spanked. My, my parents didn't slap yeah. me around. They were, not, they were not what people would consider to be abusive. But it was you right. know, sometime around 10 or 12 years old, my mother used a hairbrush. And my Ouch. dad uses used his, used his hand, and um, yeah. it was rich, it was ritualistic, um, and but I remember every second of every time. Yeah, yeah. But if you were to go back to the, the you know, a song that comes to mind that to me explains this very well. If you remember the song, the line in this song about Vincent Van Gogh that said, "This world was never meant for one as beautiful as you." Yes, incredible that song. That that yeah. that tender state of being is where we all started, and if any one of us were able to go back to that moment, when just a hostile set of eyes were turned toward us, the pain of that would be so extreme that it's unimaginable. And ultimately, to go back and undo the history of that in our whole bloodline is the objective of this work. It's not, wow. oh, yeah, we're going to go do a weekend workshop and heal. It's, it's taking on a lifetime of work of cleaning up those generational patterns of coming out of the desert. You know, you look at that story of the Jews wandering in the desert, and, and people think it was about being in a hot, sandy place, a 35-square-mile area. Hmm. Do you think this group of people who understands astronomy quite well could possibly get lost in a 35-square-mile area for 40 years? I mean, that's just silly on its face. But when you realize that was a metaphor for people living unconsciously and the desert being unconscious and creating their lives out of those unconscious generational patterns. And then you look in that passage, in that story, how did they get out of the desert into what was called the promised land and what was the promised land? Well, if you read it, 
what it says is the way they got out of the desert, they said the old generation had to die off. That didn't mean everybody in old physical bodies had to physically die. The root of the word generation is genari. It means cause. All of the causes held in the mind, held in the genes from the generations had to be removed. And then we, we stepped out of creating our lives out of unconscious energy into what was called the promised land. And that wasn't a land of milk and honey and palm trees. That was a land of conscious co-creation where we knew who we were as love, we knew we were creators, and we originated mind energy and created our lives anew. That's what was being spoken about there. And then my dad. And that's what this work um, is about. My, my, and my dad would say, "Well, <clears throat> Chris, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you." You know, it's hurt about, you. Hurt yeah, you. right. As he was, this is going to hurt me. Well, no, I, I feel like I had good parents. It's this is going to hurt oh, me. Oh, I'm not suggesting you more, did. I'm this this. It's going to hurt me more than it's going to have you, as he put me over his knee. And yep. uh, but still, that's not constructive child rearing, I guess. No. Well, you know, another one that I remember that you probably remember too is if you don't stop that crying, I'll give you something to cry for. It's like, wait a minute, I, I have that. something to cry for. That's why I'm crying. What are you talking about? But <laughs> you know, those those patterns and. Uh, and um, you know, it's all what needs to be forgiven. It's all what needs literally on an energetic level has become literal physiological chemistry, mind energy becoming flesh, and needs to be extracted from the cell, exposed to the presence of love, and removed from the structure. That's what forgiveness is, is to remove every energy of offense in any way, shape, or form. And what I realize, what my granddaughter has taught me, is that my job as her grandfather is to identify her only as love. And if she does something that resonates anything other than love in me, to recognize that's my work to do, and for me to do my work as quickly as possible so that I can return to this space where as love, I identify her as love, and I give her guidance and education on how to build a body-mind unit that is of being an expression of and a vehicle for her full manifestation or her full purpose being fulfilled in the world, that that's my job as her parent or grandparent. All right, Michael, I have another question for you. <clears throat> uh, Go for it. With this work, uh, you know, where you print out these um, exercises, um, is there like plateau stages that one reaches where yes. one very cool. where, 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 where my question where one feels better, or it's or is it just like it's probably um, my guess is it's an infinite amount of work. It is, but are there? It is okay, but are there are there are goals and or or not goals? You don't like that term, but there are um, plateau stages if you've done enough of this work, where uh, you're you feel better. And that's the there question. are plateau stages where you're gonna where you're gonna feel better. Number one, there are plateau stages where it feels like you're not getting anywhere, and and other times when it's like the major breakthrough is just like huge, and Actually, one of my favorite words is goals, and it's one of the most important things you can do in your life is set goals. Without goals, you and I would be dead. It's not the, the goal that's the problem. It's when we formulate goals out of hostility and fear that engage disintegrative energy within us that it becomes a problem. And the reason you cancel a goal is not because there's anything wrong with the goal. You only cancel the goal because you recognize that it's resonating some form of hostility or fear in you that needs to be cleaned up, that needs to be removed. But the goals, I mean, we've got a workshop called Getting the Stress You Need. The worksheet in that workshop is the Mind Goal Management Sheet. It's here's how you manage your goals to manage your mind so that you're a conscious creator in your life. So goals are a wonderful thing. It's just if they're mismanaged, we're in trouble. Yes.
breathing with you. I'm glad to be talking with you right now, hearing your voice. Sounds like you've been <clears throat> seriously doing some work. Um, that depends on how you define work. Uh, <clears throat> so, well, you is... wouldn't be able to ask me the questions you're asking if you hadn't done the work, because you wouldn't have the brain cells to do it. So, so I can I can tell, you know, from earlier conversations that we've had, how much work you've done by simply the capacity you have to ask questions. If you hadn't done any, you wouldn't. You wouldn't even. Those questions would never come to you. The questions, most of them, that you've been asking. So I most acknowledge you for I get, the work you've been most doing. Most of what I, most of what I get from you is is listening to your one to two p.m. Um, discussion. I mean, just put it that way. That's what we're here to do. So breathing with you. And actually, I have a, a private thought I'd like to share with you, and we we'll finish the show in five minutes. So when we complete the show, I know that you don't usually answer calls or you're blocked, but if you, when we get off the show, I'll, I'll give you a call. I have a thought for you. Okay. So we've got about five minutes. Any other questions or thoughts? I am not at this moment. So you're just going to leave me hanging for the last five minutes without another question. Okay. That's the way you're going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> delighted, sir. Delighted. Well, you know, you know, at least, uh, well, no, not at least. I was looking positive. Barbara King's Hillside Chapel, uh, there might be some people in my area, and we would go there, um, I, whether it's a Sunday or a Saturday or a Monday. Uh, I intend to go there, so putting that out um, means that, you know, there's some people in the Atlanta area that might be improved by going to Barbara King's Hillside Chapel, which I have nowhere, no idea where it's located. But down on the southwest side of town, she's been. Well, I first met Barbara probably 43, 44 years ago uh, when she came to one of my workshops in Florida. But she had the Hillside Chapel back then, and they've been they've done a lot of great work over the years. So, well, that's I'm um, that's You're good. there that's locally. Good. I'm glad for that. I'm glad. For and that. if you get to connect with Rocco directly, please tell him I said hello and hug his neck for me. Tell him Rocco. I send my love and and highest regards, Rocco Erico. He's their Rocco resident sounds, Aramaic scholar. Rocco sounds like uh, the name of an Italian. <laughs> Yeah, he is. He's Italian. He's a, he's Italian. That's Rocco. But he, he's a, but he's he worked with George yeah. Lamsa. He was George Lamsa's protege back when Lamsa was translating, and they worked together for years. So George Lamsa. All right, right well, we're down to the last minute here, so I'm just going to say thank you for the conversation, and everybody, thanks for joining us. Have the best year yet of your eternal life. It's an awesome gift.